Hello and welcome to Infinity. I'm Charlie Serafin. For the next half hour, we're going to be talking about interspecies communications between humans and chimpanzees. Our guest is Dr. Roger Fouts, a professor of psychology at Central Washington University. Dr. Fouts has been working with chimpanzees since 1967. He is the director of the Friends of Washoe Foundation. Who is Washoe? Washoe is, is a female chimpanzee, about 20 years old, and uh, she's famous for uh, being the very first uh, non-human animal to acquire human language. Uh, a project was begun with her in 1966, and she was raised as if she were a deaf human child and uh, acquired sign language and uh, presently we're we're continuing that research it's it's the longest running ape sign language project uh, in the world today from 60 well it's been al almost 20 years it's been going on 19 years what is the life expectancy of a chimpanzee and what is her relative maturity rate if we can transpose it on the on the human being well Wisho, who's uh, approximately 20 years old now would be comparable to about a 22 year old human uh, they live to be. They can live to be uh, uh, estimated lifespan about 60 years of age. That would be comparable to a human about 80. Uh, the the, the long, longest uh, living ones in captivity today that are still alive are about 54 and 55 years old. So during the during the period of your research, has she gone through, in terms of expression, the kinds of crises that we associate with human development? Uh, was there a puberty stage and? Uh, a rebelliousness and uh, settling down and is she having uh, romantic concerns now about being 20 years old and uh, not uh, permanently attached or does she have a permanent mate? Uh, well she doesn't have a permanent mate but she's she's with a family now. Uh, when she was, well she did, to answer your question, uh, we, we've compared it to child language development and her uh, sign language matches very nicely that of, of young children and uh, then Granted, puberty was, was stressful, and if you can stay with a chimpanzee through puberty, you can probably stay the rest of their lives <laughs> with them. That's the toughest part because that is the testing, where they're testing all the time, and, and, and uh, they're, they're not sure what, what they're about. But with females, it's a bit easier because uh, female chimpanzees have a relatively peaceful puberty. Males, on the other hand, it's, it's pretty stressful for a, for a male chimp to go through puberty uh, just because he's trying to become integrated into a, an adult group at that time. Um, at about... Um, uh, 14, 13 years of age, 14 years, I guess she was 14 when she became pregnant. Uh, she lost her baby, uh, died after about two months. She went into a, an extreme period of grief. And uh, then what we did is we found a 10-month-old for her, her to adopt. She adopted the infant. And at that point, the humans stopped signing around Warsho. And so we moved into the, sort of the second phase of the project and where we looked at cultural transmission. And we found that her adoptive infant, whose name is Lulus, acquired his sign language from her and not from the humans. And then that was ended last summer. And presently, what we're looking at now, uh, she and Lulus are with uh, three other signing chimpanzees, uh, Moja, who's 12, and Dar, who is a uh, eight-year-old. Well, he'll, he'll be nine in August. And uh, uh, Tatu, who is nine years old presently, and they all sign. And what we've been looking at now is the chimpanzee chimpanzee conversations, what they're talking about. How do you? How is the research set up? Are they constantly being monitored so that you can see what's going on? Well, we have two levels. One is is live observation, uh, and we take about uh, five data sampling sessions a day, about forty-five minute session. Then at other times, we'll sample with a video camera. We'll put video cameras in their rooms. Uh, connect them with cables to another room, uh, and then observe them without humans being present. And that's uh, what we're focusing on right now in terms of a detailed analysis of the conversation. So basically what we're finding is that the chimps are, are talking to one another even though humans aren't around. What do chimps talk about when uh, humans aren't around? Well, uh, it depends on, on their age and, and what they're doing. Uh, we did one study. We, we, we did 15 hours of this, and we focused on, on Lulus, the, the chimp who, who acquired his signs from, from other chimps. And he, of course, uh, uh, was young, about four years old at the time when we did the, the tape we just got through analyzing. And we found that, lo and behold, he spent most of his time conversing with Dar, who was, was a comparable age, you might say a peer playmate. Uh, then next was uh, Tatu, and then finally his mother, and then Moja, who was an older female. Uh, the things they conversed about primarily were social things. They had to do with play, uh, reassurance, and grooming. And, uh, however, reassurance, mainly he, he talked uh, in the context of reassurance to his mother, play mainly to Dar, 
and uh, the, the grooming with, with just about everybody. Uh, so what we're finding is that it's primarily sho social, and if you're a young chimpanzee, it's primarily play. Uh, if you're a chimpanzee mother, uh, your children are mainly going to talk to you about reassuring them after they've gotten in trouble or they want to, uh, somebody's picked on them that they didn't feel should have picked on them and so on. In terms of when we talk about signing, what, how big a vocabulary and what kinds of words uh, have been transmitted to, to the chimps? What kinds of uh, uh, structure are they using? Well, Washo uh, has a vocabulary of about 260 signs, and uh, they range all the way from personal pronouns to, to, to nouns to verbs, adjectives, and so on. Uh, what I mean by that, uh, she can say, uh, uh, please give me that uh, green apple, or uh, give me that, uh, uh, you know, that's a red hat, and so on. Uh, she can also claim she's good. She can insult people by claiming they're dirty or, or insult them in a other fashions also. Uh, perhaps one of the more fascinating things they do with their language, from my point of view, I mean, what, what we run into over and over again is their metaphorical use of, of the signs. Oftentimes they'll, they'll be involved with things that they don't have a specific sign for. Typically what they'll do at that time is they'll take other signs in their vocabulary, recombine it, and describe it. For example, Warshaw referred to fruit leather. Uh, this was some we made for her, and it was uh, uh, made from plums, and she calls plums typically nut berries. Well, when we drew, we ground up the plums, dried it out, and it was turned it into fruit leather, and gave it to her, and, and she referred to that as nutberry paper. On the same day, Tatu, who had never experienced fruit leather before either, referred to the fruit leather as fruit blanket. Both of those are very metaphorical and very apropos, but that gives you an idea of, of what what they do. Also, in terms of grammar, we have found evidence for grammar, but it has to be a structured si situation. Uh, what we find in the social communication. Uh, number one, they're mainly young chimps. That, that grammar doesn't play a very important role there. Uh, number two, sign language is a highly inflected language. What I mean by that, rather than saying, you tickle me, all a chimp has to do is look at a person, reach over, and sign tickle on that person's hand, which says the same thing. So they can inflect the signs in that fashion, uh, which reduces the need for, for word order, per se. Mm -hmm. uh, spoken language, like Russians, are highly, is a highly inflected language. Uh, so we, we really don't see the order that much, but we, but I'm not surprised it's it's not there. Do they talk about you uh, personally, and do they talk about the other humans, and what do they think of you, and does it ever hurt your feelings? <laughs> they, they when when I'm not attending, say I'm I'm busy, and Warsho can see me, she'll she'll sign my name. Of course, my name is made on the ear, and you can't you can't hear it, so I don't know. So the way she'll typically get my attention is she she's developed what we call a person sign, which was originally a name sign, and it's patting the top of the head, which is silent unless you, you know, slap it, and then then you can hear her. And if I don't respond then, then she turns to a dirty sign, which is made by uh, touching the wrist, the back of the wrist to the chin, and what she'll do is to, in insulting me in this fashion, because it's also used to refer to soil items and feces, among other things, is she'll bang her jaw so hard that it will you know, clack her teeth together. And so you know that she's insulting somebody with that. Um, otherwise, she'll, she'll sign, love you, you know, that she, she loves you. And that's usually my, my greeting in the morning. She'll say, love, love. And, and I'll say, how are you feeling? And she might s make the smile sign or the happy sign. And uh, if they're hurt, uh, they might sign, cry, or tell you that they're, 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 they're hurt or where they hurt by using the hurt sign. Uh, but in terms of uh, saying... Uh, well, beyond that, they, they really don't describe you too much. Usually it's an interaction of how are we going to interact and how do they feel about you or, or uh, each other. We've talked about uh, Coco the gorilla and the communication that's going on there. Are there, and I'm sure you're aware of that research uh, to some degree, mm -hmm. are there major differences with chimpanzees? Why chimpanzees or gorillas, or is it pretty much the same thing? I think it's pretty much the same thing. Uh, it's very, very, of course, Penny Patterson modeled her, her uh, research after Project Washo, and uh, in that the, we raised Washo as if she were a deaf child. The major difference was that with Washo, for her first five years, we didn't use any vocal English. With Penny, uh, she uses signing and, and vocal English. Uh, other than that, they would be uh, uh, differences in terms of methodology and scientific procedure, uh, which are 
you know, pretty, uh, unless you're an experimental psychologist, they, they, they may not be that interesting, but they are uh, significant differences if you're, if you're a scientist. One of the questions that's commonly asked, which is difficult to answer, is where does this animal rate in terms of relative intelligence if we put uh, human beings, and this is a uh, somewhat tenuous assumption, at the top and, and other animals at the bottom? Where do the chimpanzees rate? Well, I, number one, if, if you're, well, the way psychologists define intelligence is intelligence is what intelligence tests measure. In other words, we have no idea what it is. And if you're familiar with intelligence tests, they really aren't even valid within human spe within the human species across cultures, or within uh, within a society across different socioeconomic groups, and so on. So when you move across species, uh, you're you, there. You've made a great leap, and and it, it's it's not valid to use a test. However, if I was speculating, uh, I think you should take the critter on your own on their own terms. And if our intelligence tests, human, or if there was such one, that was based on the ability to read nonverbal communication and spot a sucker, you might say, and manipulate people like a very good, say, salesman of some sort, mm -hmm. then I think the chimpanzees would turn out much higher than humans. They can, they can spot a sucker a mile off. They'll know your weak points, your strong points, and they'll exp They'll, they'll, they'll use it to their advantage. So in terms of being sensitive to reading nonverbal, which I, I would view as, as, well, I view intelligence as being sort of a cognitive continuum, going from what I call simultaneous processing, which is like reading nonverbal. In other words, when, uh, if you meet somebody uh, on, on the street, or your friend, say a friend, and, and you, you introduce them and they say, hello, my name's John Smith, and they walk off and your friend says, I, I can't stand that person. You say, what's wrong? All they said is, Hello, my name's John Smith. And they'll say it's a gut level feeling. Well, it's mm -hmm. not in their gut. It's actually occurring in their brain, but it's occurring simultaneously. And they're responding to it. They're feeling it with their body. They're going in synchrony, and they feel uncomfortable. Now, if you probably you, uh, analyzed it, say if you took a camera that shot at 200 frames a second and you shot that little scene, you'd probably see slight mouth, mouth movements, eye, eye moves, uh, maybe hair moving up a little bit. Uh, breaking gaze in one direction, micromomentary movements of the face, and so on, that come at you all at once and so fast that the, the conscious mind, if you will, the sequential process, as I call it, which has to freeze things and verbalize them into sequential acts, misses it. So you just call it intuition. That's where the chimpanzees excel. I've yet to meet a human that can respond to that behavior as well as a chimp do, does. And it's a type of intelligence. If we look at that simultaneous process, that's where Einstein got, e got equals mc squared. He didn't sit down and, and spend 20 years figuring it out. It came to him. And then he had to spend the rest of his life trying to take that concept and translate it into a sequential phenomena, i.e. verbal English or, or mathematical formulas, in order so that the rest of us could understand it. So it, it's it's... It's a respectable, you might say, form of cognition. I know that's a, a long answer to a no, simple question. No, I think a very complete answer. If, in fact, this, that is the case, if, in, at least according to some uh, levels of, of evaluation, the chimpanzee is, has far superior intelligence or ability to analyze certain situations, then why take the chimpanzee back through this rudimentary very uh, slow, deliberate process of language. Well, we, we, we didn't. Uh, what we did is we raised Washo as if she were a deaf human child, and we used gestures, and she picked it up. And, and she's certainly not using it uh, as a, a professor of English grammar would use the English language when they write. Uh, definitely not. She uses it as a social communication. It is rule following, but it's not English. It's different than English. And I think uh, some scientists make a, a very large mistake by taking rules for English grammar and saying, okay, let's see what the chimps are doing. Well, it's not the same language and a different species. And it's social communication, too. Uh, chimpanzees gesture naturally in the wild. In fact, they, there are dialects between different communities in their gestures. So we're not teaching a dog to fly. Chimps gesture. What we did is we took the chimp on their terms. We don't know how language is acquired in our species. We don't know where, uh, but we do know where, and that's acquired in the family. So the approach was, because we don't 
nowhere, and we disagree with Skinner, we don't think it's because somebody drops M&Ms into your mouth. I know my parents did not withhold a bowl of cereal from me until I would say, please, Daddy, give me a spoonful of cereal, period, and then reinforce me. It doesn't happen that way. <laughs> um, where it does occur is in spontaneous social relationships <clears throat> within the family. <clears throat> so we modeled Woysha's upbringing after that not knowing how or why it occurs within that, but we knew that's where it happened. And she acquired it. And she acquired a gestural language because that's what chimps do. They don't have the control over vocal speech that we do. So in essence, what we did is we took them on their terms. If you look at the vast majority of science, uh, the early uh, studies, they attempted to teach apes vocal language. And the main reason that was that egocentricism, uh, the anthropocentric, center of the universe. If I do it this way, you have to do it that way. And uh, we didn't. And uh, we don't propose to. So we're not sort of dragging her through uh, uh, English grammar. Uh, we're giving her uh, a mode of communication, uh, granted uh, a naturally occurring human one, that we both can, can, can use. So sign language for her is no different than if, if I uh, was, was raised uh, with French rather than, than English, even though I'm, I'm uh, you know, uh, my parents are native, native speakers of English. I guess you know, it would be impossible to answer this, but are there concepts which she has mastered in which she, um, you talked about the use of metaphors, are there concepts that have grown out of her association with humans that might not be natural, even though gesturing would be natural to a chimpanzee? Or can I, you tell? Yeah. Well, well, I think gesturing is, is natural, but I think uh, there is. Um, and I base that on, on some, some research that we've done. Uh, what, and this gets a little theoretical, what I think happens with, with the average human brain is we start out fairly evenly balanced between the, the, the two processes, the sequential and the simultaneous. Some people might call that left brain, right brain. I personally don't think it's that. I have, think it, which is another story, it has to do with gray matter versus white matter, not in terms of the two hemispheres. And uh, what happens is the fine motor movement in our language give our brain extreme exercise in terms of sequential processing, which produces the what we call the lateralization. In other words, we become a very sequential-oriented critter. The fact that American Sign Language that Warshaw has acquired is more sequential than what the chimps do in the wild. They do use gestures, but much more nonverbal communication. Uh, I think we've, we've changed her processing a little bit. In fact, we did a test with her that young children and animals solve it one way, but adult humans solve it another, and it's been attributed to, to uh, language. Warshaw did it the way the adult humans do. Other chimps that did not have sign language did it the way the animals and young children do. So I think we, we may have affected that. In other words, what that's saying about the brain is that uh, you can exercise it, that your environment, what you're pulling in, what you're grabbing in terms of information-wise uh, with your brain can affect its development. And uh, this is very subtle. It's probably very, not very significant as far as worship is concerned, but I think it is a difference. Are you interested in and concerned with the possibility of transferring that sequential processing on through genetics to offspring, the hundredth monkey theory in a, in a oh. laboratory setting. <sighs> that th I, I think you'd have to do it for a lot of genera generations. I know this is, is blasphemy for a science to say, but but um, after looking at animal behavior for a long time, it's hard for me to totally reject Lamarckianism in that there, there may be some uh, acquired characteristics that are inherited. And the reason I say that, it, it, I have no evidence other than, than simple logic. If you look at, at, um, at camels, they have uh, calluses in all the right spots. Uh, chimps, 35% of the chimps are born with what we call ischial callosities, calluses on their bottoms. Uh, birds have calluses for the eggs, and they're born this way. Now, if it's just random selection, a callus isn't that much. For example, my, the, the palm of my hand, the skin there is a little thicker than it is in the rest of the body. So is the bottom of my feet and my elbows. Now, if it's random selection, why don't I have a small callus someplace else? It wouldn't be that hard to carry, and it wouldn't be really de deleterious. Why did they end up where they ended up? 
Uh, if it's truly random selection, then indeed every single one of us have to be extremely lucky. In fact, I think such a lucky species indeed that Las Vegas would have been out of business a long time ago. <laughs> uh, so I guess what I'm suggesting is that Darwin is, is certainly correct, but I think there's got to be some mechanism where the environment plays more than just a passive role as a filter, where it gives it a little direction and says, bang, you're on, stay with it, go with it. There are some theories about this out now, and, and some of them are quite controversial. Uh, Sheldrick has one on the new science of life that that um, I think half of the, the scientists want to burn the book, and and, uh, and the other half are saying he's taken a bold move, which indeed he has. But as to my way of thinking, the old passive environment and just sheer random selection really can't explain a lot of behavior. Darwin's held up a long time. I mean, it's very good to have a theory last, you know, a uh, hundred years as well as it has. But uh, like all theories, they have a half-life and they will be replaced by something else. And I see us as on the verge of that. Are chimps judgmental in the way that humans are? Oh, you talked yeah. about meeting someone on the street and having an instant reaction mm -hmm. and in your gut you don't like that person. Uh, does she express that sort of thing as you introduce strangers? Very much so. Very much so. In fact, uh, it's one of the things we hope to study eventually. In, in the lab, we call it, uh, we have two classifications uh, for the extremes. One is a person is Solomon's ring. <coughs> we refer to them as having Solomon's ring. And that they walk in and the chimps are relaxed. They like them. There's no banging, no spitting, no testing. Other people will walk in and they bang. The hair goes up. They get very, very upset. And we say those people have killer appeal and that they're the type of person that appeals to killers. <laughs> uh, I think a lot of it has to do with nonverbal. And looking at this, I think also a lot of us have repressed hostility and or aggression. And the chimp can spot that and they're going to call you on it immediately. They're going to say, oh, yeah, <laughs> you know, you may be, you know, fool every human. But the chimp is going to see it, and they're going to respond to it. So being around them is almost like being around uh, a, a, a psychotherapist you've been working with for 10 years. I mean, there's almost nothing you can hide. What can we learn from the chimps? Well, we can learn a lot more about ourselves. And uh, one of the things that uh, I like to see happen is that uh, with these, the, the chimps talking and so on, that we realize that, that we are uh, a part of nature, not, uh, oh, how, how should I put it? Uh, not that I'm advocating that we take off our clothes and, and go back to the trees or, or, or jump back to... Uh, to worshiping the you know the series as as a goddess and so on, but but to realize that we it seems to me that Western philosophy, Descartes being the major villain, who who some Cartesians even even uh, there was a quote it was a remarkable one from a Cartesian they said uh, in that he Descartes felt that man had a soul and everything else didn't they were machines in fact even women weren't. Uh, considered much beyond animals. In fact, they were they were they were put in that category of animals because they bore children, which was supposedly a biological th um, uh, because you know a biological thing above or below men. But uh, one Cartesian said that a dog that yelps when it's kicked suffers no more than a bell that rings when it's struck. And unfortunately, uh, in in my discipline and related disciplines there is a certain scientism going on that holds that same attitude. They justify the exploitation of animals by saying, in fact, one fellow uh, with a federal agency told me that they used monkeys because they, the monkeys didn't think nor did they feel. And so it's okay to do the things they were planning to do, to, to do with them. I would hope that, that one thing that Washo and Lulis and the rest of them have taught us is that they do think, they do feel, and perhaps most important of all, they suffer. And I think that as we accept this, as we move out of the dark ages of Descartes and realize that we're in this together, that granted we aren't apes and apes aren't us, and granted we are unique, but so are chimpanzees and so are or rats and cockroaches for that matter. Everything is unique. Um, and different. There's definitely d d diversity. 
but there's also a, a continuity within that diversity, and we have to recognize that continuity. And also, we have to look at science carefully and realize that, granted, empirical evidence is fine, that's great, but we also have to start looking at moral issues. In other words, is it moral to do this, and is it rational? Much of the research I see going on today is not rational. Uh, our research has helped our species. That's not the, the, the measure I use for it, but we have uh, developed treatments for non-communicating autistic children, cerebral palsy children, hemiplegic children, and uh, our next aim is uh, in uh, looking at the classroom, how the teacher how to facilitate teaching. But uh, I'd, uh, that's what I'd like to see is, is, is a new awareness where, where we start accepting the responsibility for sub what we fancy ourselves as the higher primate. And it's there. It's even in Judeo-Christian, the Bible, it's there. In Ecclesiastic, Solomon says, where is it written that the soul of man ascends and the soul of the beast descends? Question mark. He goes on to say that, that man hath no preeminence over the beast. And when you put those two together, uh, they not according, you know, I mean, if from a Judeo-Christian point of view, the animals have souls too, which immediately moves it right into morality. Does Washoe recognize herself in the mirror? She certainly does, and they even recognize themselves on television sets. And uh, they use mirrors readily as a tool. They'll, they'll, Washoe has used it to, to clean her teeth with that she couldn't see, uh, to pick things off of her back that, that she couldn't see. So uh, they, they definitely know who they are. Yeah, they Do they have a similar sense of ego? in terms of how good I look today? or To a degree, yes, which is unfortunate because I think that's <laughs> one of our major problems in our species is the ego always gets us into trouble. And uh, the chimps are closer to us biochemically than they are to a gorilla. And so I'd be surprised not to find an ego function there. But you do see pride, you do see vanity, and uh, some of those other uh, things that we could well do without. All of the animal kingdom is communicating constantly most of that communication is unrecognized or unnoticed by humans. If we could recognize the communication in the animal kingdom, how would the world be different? Well, uh, we would realize our, our connection with nature. I think what we did in regard to nature, we, we, we didn't just simply uh, transcend it. We disassociated it and ended up repressing it. And I don't think we'd exploit it. I don't think... Uh, we would go in with this uh, humanism attitude. You know, that's not humanistic, but humanism, and by justifying everything to the benefit of one species and wipe out everything. Uh, we're in a bit of trouble. I, I have faith in, in, in Mother Earth. I think she'll correct herself. Whether we're around or not, I don't know. When you consider that 99% of the species are extinct that we know about, there's probably... Uh, it's probably a higher figure, and so it goes. Uh, we certainly can go our way as has the dinosaur. Uh, but I would hope we'd have the intelligence. Just, you know, rather than just a real quick date with uh, existence on this planet, maybe we could, you know, stretch it out a little bit. This is Infinity. Remember to keep your mind open and listen to your heart. I'm Charlie Serafin. Thank you for listening.